The DNA of the torso was tested and it comes back that it is human and that it does belong to Ashley Young. Mm. Ashley's arms and legs were later found in a box in Jared's apartment. That's when Ashley's mom, Christine, recalls the incident from a few days prior. You already know what it is. It's your boy laid back with another reaction, another review, another episode. Hey, TikTok, you up to bat. Bah! It's your boy Laid Back. Welcome back to my channel. Hey, two things we gotta do. You gotta hit that subscribe button. I'm drinking this water. You already know what it is, man. Elevate more in 2024. Elevate more in 2024. Make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit the notification bell. Stay up to date with all the videos. We back with another TikTok reaction. Hey, this one right here is a lot. It's a lot of true crime stuff. It's some paranormal stuff going on. It's some different stories. It's a lot. You make it to the end of this one, you a real one for real. I'm just gonna tell you that right off the rip. This one is different. Also, if you into this type of stuff, man, I got a TikTok playlist. You can go through and binge watch, enjoy, have your mind blown. But let's go ahead and get into it. Fire Squad, what's popping? Let's get it. Tell me your craziest one in a million stories. So my husband and I had decided that it was time for us to start a family. And I, we call our friends and we're like, hey, we're pulling the goalie. If you guys want to have kids right now, that'd be super cool so that our kids could be friends. And they were like, yeah, that would be really cool. Wow. And she and I had you talked and her plan was that she was going to be a stay-at-home mom. And I told her, I was like, well, the only way I could be a stay-at-home mom is if uh, I have twins because uh, with just one baby, I'd have to go back to work. Six months go by and I call her and I'm like, all right, it's go time. I just found out I'm pregnant and I need you to get pregnant right now if we're going to make this work. So she's like, okay. So she takes a ovulation test and it comes back uh, super bright and she looks it up and it turns out that that could mean she's already pregnant. So then she takes a pregnancy test. It was positive. She calls me. She's like, oh my God, I'm also pregnant right now. And I was like, what? We go to our doctor's appointments, obviously separate times. And we turn out we're seven days apart in pregnancy. And that's not the craziest thing. Tell me your craziest one in a million stories. Six months and 50 seconds. Let's go. I had a car that someone stole unauthorized use while I was sleeping. They used it in a crime, got shot up, blood, everything. Because of that and they couldn't find me, they assigned homicide detectives. CSI releases a car a few days later. I go, take it, gets totaled. I had equity in a car, but not enough to buy another one. They only gave me $213 back. Go to a car lot, find a good deal on a car, not the car I wanted, but scrounge up some money with the $213. Bam, time to get a car. In between paydays, though. Get outside, realize the tires are bald. So I spent four hours with them giving me new tires. Go home, park the car. Move the car because in my neighborhood, there had been break-ins. So I park it on the street where other people were parked. Wake up the next morning, boom, somebody hits the new car. A month to the day that the last car got totaled. A woman hit me, another woman, and totaled all three of our cars. Come to find out she didn't have insurance. My insurance had to sue her. She goes missing. Because I got such a good deal on that car, I had a way more equity. Get a check, go buy a new car. Come to find out the guy that was selling me my car was on the phone with an insurance company trying to sell her one but couldn't confirm insurance. Three months later, go to a new doctor. The lady behind the counter was the lady that hit me. Tell me your craziest <laughs> one in a million story. Something Damn. that happened to you that you just can't believe was That's real. That's crazy. So back in 2013, I was a senior in high school and I opened the back door for my father and I ended up fainting and hitting my head on one of our doorknobs that's like this shape. So I had a seizure and I had to go to the hospital the next day anyway for a cast change. And I just went to sleep. I woke up the next morning and I was unsure of who my mom was when she came to wake me up. Whoa. And then I went to the hospital and uh, didn't really know my name or my birthday or anything. They admit admitted me. And then over the next several days, I continuously just lost more and more and ended up having severe retrograde amnesia. And I lost the first 18 years of memory. I'm now 25. Years? I remember everything since then. So I have seven wow. years of memory in a 25-year-old body. Wow. <laughs> Tell me your craziest... Hold on, man. Hold on. In the comments, if you got a crazy story, put it in the comments so we can read it, man. That was crazy. 25 with a seven-year memory. Whoa. One in a million story. Something that happened to you that you just can't believe was real. So I'm a freshman in high school. It's 2008. We get to school on the bus and there are news vans everywhere. News people, parking lots packed. No one on the bus has any idea what the fuck is going on. We get into school. Everything's relatively normal. But I have gym first hour. So I head straight to the gym. I don't see anyone around. None of my classmates. 
and I get to the hallway to the locker rooms and there's a giant curtain. Go through the curtain, don't think anything of it, and then there's 20 men staring at me. All in suits, all like, why the hell is this kid back here? And someone walks through them, greets me, and says, I don't think you have Jim today, I'm very sorry. That man was future president Barack Obama. Wow. Tell me your craziest one in a million story. Wow. Okay, so back in 2016, I got a promotion with my job and was transferring from Texas to uh, Nashville. And my company flew me out to look for an apartment. And on the flight back, when I was ready to go pack everything, uh, I met a girl on the flight and we kind of hit it off, had some drinks and exchanged info and she lived in Nashville. So I was really excited to have a friend there once I got to town. So a couple months later, I get to the city and we start hanging out all the time and we're out at a bar one night and I posted a story on Instagram and a friend of mine from college who I used to be really, really close with, but hadn't seen in a really long time, sent me a DM and was like, I can't believe you're in Nashville. We have to hang out ASAP. I live 20 minutes away or 30 minutes away. So he, I actually invited him to join us that night. Okay. And he and my girlfriend that I was with ended up hitting it off and started dating, which I thought was super sweet. And the three of us had a ton of fun together hanging out. So a couple of months into them dating, we were out one night uh, having dinner and my girlfriend showed me a picture of this guy on Instagram and was like, hey, what do you what do you think about this guy? And I was like, I mean, he's cute, but I mean, is he nice? And she's like, yeah, I went to high school with him. I I'm just going to invite him. It'll be fun. So he comes He's really cute. We get along really well. Uh, tons of flirting, lots of chemistry. Um, we exchanged info. And then a couple weeks later, he called and asked me out on a date. So uh, we went out to dinner, had a great time, and ended up spending most of that weekend together. This happened on a uh, Memorial Day weekend. So we both didn't have work on Monday. Um, turns out my dad, my grandpa, and my little brother were going to be passing through Nashville that Monday and they wanted to take me out to dinner. And, uh, okay. so I asked my guy if he wanted to come into Nashville with me. And, uh, so we just like both took separate cars and he hung out at my apartment while I went to dinner with my dad, since we were still like so new, it just it didn't feel right time to like meet my parents. So the weirdest part of the whole situation was while we were driving, he, he was driving first and I was like following behind him and I caught a glimpse of his license plate and, uh, it was really strange to me. So I asked him once we got to my apartment, Hey, like how long have you had the license plate that you have on your car? And he was like, Oh, I don't know. I mean, since I got the car when I was like 15 or 16, I kid you not, this license plate was my first middle and last initial plus my month and day birth date what? and now six years later we are engaged and about to get married wow wow you talking about stars tell me your craziest one in a million story something that happened to you that you just can't believe was real so i'm working a trial shift at a place called the beijing banquet um it's a chinese buffet quite local to my area and I go over to this table of four. I'm just clearing plates. And I, asked, I said to the mum, how was your meal? And she said, oh, it's lovely. We'll be seeing your face more often because we're regulars here. We're religiously here every Saturday. We look forward to your service. Brilliant. The mum loved the meal. I asked her dad how her meal was. She loved it. These two kids, one was sat on his phone and one was eating away at his food. The guy that was eating away at his food said he loved his meal. But this little cunt said, fuck all to me. So I said again, how did you enjoy your meal, mate? And he blanks me. He's actually just sat laughing at his phone. So I look over and he sat laughing at a kid with Down syndrome. And I go, that's not funny, man. Don't laugh at people with Down syndrome. Would you like it if you had Down syndrome? The dad goes, he does have Down syndrome. And he fucking looks up at me. That little cunt was on Snapchat laughing at his own face. I didn't get the job. Tell me your craziest one in a million story. Something that happened to you that you just what? can't believe was real. I'll take your one in a million and raise you to one in 15 million. So you and your wife do IVF to get pregnant. You have one embryo. It's your last embryo. You do the transfer, you're pregnant. Amazing. Great. You go see the doctor. When you get to the doctor, she's doing the ultrasound. And next thing you know, she says, wow, there's a second heartbeat in here. So twins, that's great. That's exciting. You're trying to digest twins and you're looking at each other. And then the doctor says, hold on. I see another sack. There's a third heartbeat. Whoa. At this point, you start freaking out. <laughs> My wife is hyperventilating, has to take off her mask, and the doctor oh. says, I need to go back in and check something out. 
The doctor goes back in, and there's another sac and no. a fourth heartbeat. No. Quadruplets. Transferred one embryo, four babies. That's your one in a million. Four babies. Tell me your craziest one in a million story. Something that happened to you that you just can't believe was real. My grandpa died in 1989, and when they did, the family had to sell all of the belongings, including the house, the car, and the truck. Mm. Two years later, my grandma, who had been in the nursing home, also passed away. And when she passed away, she left me $500 in her will. It came at the perfect time because I was married and pregnant and in desperate need of a new vehicle. My husband and his dad looked around and they found a 1977 Dodge Monaco, which is so big that when you turn a corner, your back wheels come around the corner 30 seconds later. <laughs> anyway, the car was $500. It was perfect. And about a week later, I noticed there was a bumper sticker on the back for the local Christian radio station, which was the only one that my grandparents listened to. And the dealer mark on the back was also where they bought their cars. No. My dad and I checked into it and it turns out that I had actually bought my grandmother's car with the money that she had given me in her will. Wow. What is your one in a million story? Wow. Something that happened to you that you just couldn't wow. believe it happened? I got escorted onto the plane by counter-terrorist police after a friend of mine's mum basically called the police on us and said that we were going to Syria to become jihadi wives. Wow. <laughs> so why did she think that? I think she wasn't very well and didn't want us going on holiday. My passport always gets checked now. Like extra scanning, extra everything, so yeah. So, what is the relationship like now between you, your friend, and her mum? Uh, we're not really friends anymore. Like, no, no sure. hard feelings, it wasn't her fault. But it was, like, a lot of things on that holiday happened. I think tensions were high, so we're not that close anymore. Tell me your craziest one in a million story. Something that happened to you that you just can't believe was real. Back in 2013, I used to work at this bar in New Haven, Connecticut called The Russian Lady. I end up working with this girl who's Dominican like I am and also adopted from Dominican Republic. Super cool, we shared the same story and we hit it off right away. We got along, everybody started noting how we looked alike and you know, we're probably sisters. Oh shit. Child anyway. We hung out all the time. We started twinning, we wore the same clothes. Oh, we um, actually bought shirts one day that said, I'm the big sister, I'm the little sister. So we used to fuck with people all the time. Fast forward to 2021, and I finally convinced her to take a 23andMe test. Let's see. I mean, you're adopted. Let's see if we could find your family. Mm. We got the results in yesterday. I'm her family. I am her sister. Wow. Same mom, same dad. Wow. It's time for another scary story. This story takes place at my grandma's house, specifically in Maryville area in Phoenix, Arizona. So this house has a lot of scary stories, but let me tell you the few scary stories that are very similar to each other that happened throughout the years. So there was this one specific time one of my grandma's sisters was living with her at the time and she would get home around 2 a.m. in the morning from work. When she got home from work, she stated that she heard knocking coming from the glass sliding doors to the backyard. As she got closer, she said that she saw that it was a little boy knocking on the door. He was looking into the glass sliding doors and knocking at the same time. She stated that she turned on the lights to get a, be a better view of the kid. But she said when she turned on the lights, he wasn't there anymore. And that she went to the backyard and when she went back there, there was nobody. It was oh empty, God. nobody was out there. So she just left back inside. That is so creepy, right? Wait, it gets creepier. This one time, my uncle, which is my dad's brother, she was living with my grandma at the time. He stated that he was in his room with the door open, laying in his bed. So he had a view of the hallway from his bed since his door was open, you know? He stated that he saw a little boy peek into his room and just run back to the hallway towards the living room. He assumed it was me and my siblings with my parents for a surprise visit like we always did we always went for surprise visits to go see them he was wrong he got up after he saw the boy running towards the living room and he said that when he checked the whole house there was nobody there he said that he checked the doors they were all locked he checked the windows they were Ew, all bro. shut closed and locked as well he right away got creeped out he ended up waiting in the front yard for my grandma to get home because he was that scared. Wait, 
there's more. There was this one specific time my great grandparents were visiting from Mexico and they always stayed with my grandma. My grandma said that late at night my great grandpa woke up yelling with pain. She obviously ran to him and said, what is going on? What is wrong? My great grandpa told her that there was a little boy sitting on his leg and that it was hurting to get him off. My grandpa insisted on her getting that boy that was not even on his leg off of him. Guys, my grandma said she was so scared because there was nobody on his leg. She was so creeped out. There was this other time my grandma had her brother and his wife visiting her and they had a young boy that was around four years old at the time. She said that that young boy interrupted their grown-up conversations and insisted on her to follow him to the hallway because he said that there was a little boy who wanted to talk to her. That, that mm. boy was asking for Sylvia, which was my grandma. So my grandma said that the little four-year-old pulled her by her hand and pulled her to the hallway and said, he wants to talk to you. He's right there. My grandma said there was nobody there, obviously, and she was so creeped out because this isn't the first time she has heard of this little boy in her house. She told him, there's nobody there, like, no, there's nobody there, mijo, like, she said that he started crying, saying, yes, he is, he's right there, he wants to talk to you, talk to him. One creepy thing about her house that always happens also is it's almost as if a little kid is messing with you. For instance, my uncle, my dad, and a lot of other family members that have stayed at my grandma's because a lot of people actually have lived with her because she always invited people kindly like you guys can live with me when they needed somewhere to stay have stated that in the middle of the night they get the blankets pulled off of them almost as if a kid's playing with them Hell things no. end up going Whoa. missing and you literally find them in places you would have never thought you would find them in other words places you for sure know you did not she put the stuff that different. were missing yep. at so those are the stories about my grandma's house let me know if this was a creepy story or not. You look mad different. You look mad different, yo. This is gonna scare you though. I don't know. If no, I no, I it. do it, do it. I love no, those stories. This is a real story. So lately, I've been feeling kind of not myself. Man. What? Yeah. And you know, I'm religious. I'm very religious. So I decided to go to church on a Wednesday. Oh, okay, that's sick. So I went to church, and um, this is gonna sound scary to you, but. Yeah. When it came time for like communion, you know, yeah. when you get the bread, the Eucharist. Yeah. This is kind of fucked to say, but like I was walking toward the priest and I had this urge to laugh. Yeah, fam. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, no, like I had this urge to like burst out laughing. I was scared, right? I just kept praying and then, you know what I mean? Locked it away. Like, yeah, yeah. and then one night I had a dream. It was like I heard someone screaming. I was in the living room and I heard someone screaming for their life. They were like screaming, like, get me out. Get, like like yeah like screaming this is exactly what i heard in my head you're gonna get scared okay. this is exactly what i heard in my head I... here we go with this shit. i've always thought that my daughter was my grandmother reincarnated i gave her a picture of her today and uh you guys tell me what you think this is the first time showing arrow this picture i want to see how she reacts What she say? <coughs> Who is that? <coughs> she said it's me? She's touching her own face. Whoa. What the fuck? Is that your Era, who is that? Why were you just touching your own face? Is that yours? Can I put this away? Whoa. What are you saying, Amy? How? Y'all believe in reincarnation? Let me know. Has been in my freezer for 37 years. And I was always told it was like a wedding cake top. 
Adam Smith had been living in this apartment, taking care of his mother who passed away from cancer just days ago. He showed us a photograph of a wrap box that was in his freezer. He said his mother kept it inside their freezer for decades and told him to stay away from it. He opened it after she passed away. There was a pink blanket, baby blanket, and when I, I reached down and touched it and I could feel a foot and I could see the baby's head with hair hair was still what? attached to it. He's distraught thinking about the possibility that that child may have been his sister and what his mother may have done. Preliminary testing led investigators to believe the child was wearing clothes made in the mid to late 1960s and that he was younger than one year old when he died. The baby was never legally what? named, police say. What? A baby in a freezer? In 2005, this man would terrorize an entire community in Maine, and he's never been caught. In the sleepy town of Cape Elizabeth, this man, who became known as the Cape Intruder, began breaking into people's homes just to watch them sleep. The Cape Intruder would only break into homes where doors and windows were left unlocked, and he would never take anything or harm anybody, but he would just stand over the victims and watch them sleep. Some people would wake up to him standing over them, but he would always disappear before they could act. It left the entire town terrified and paranoid to go to sleep. It got to the point that there were so many break-ins that the community set up neighborhood watches to try and catch the man doing this. Victims came forward and worked with police to create this composite sketch. But the break-ins eventually stopped and the man was never caught. And to this day, the Cape Intruder is still out there. Breaking in people crib, watching them sleep? Come on, man. Shout out to all of those TikTok videos that talk about if you're walking in the woods in Appalachia and you hear something or you see something, no, you didn't. Because I think that just saved my life last night. Story time. Excuse the garage. I'm at my parents' place. And this is the only place my dog is allowed, who plays a crucial role in this story, by the way. Um, he's a very, very good boy. And last night proved it. Huh. So my parents don't live in Appalachia, but they do live in an area that's a little more secluded. It's still a suburb, but it's pressed up against these hills with lots of untouched wilderness and coyotes are running through there all the time. It's just a little bit more rural. So I'm sitting in their backyard, which has this tall fence all the way around it. And the wilderness comes right up to that fence. I'm sitting there around the campfire. My dog is laying beside me. I got my laptop open and I'm writing my little stories. Suddenly my dog lifts his head, stares straight ahead at the fire. Doesn't even like look around at the yard, stares straight ahead at the fire and starts to growl. All dog owners know that your dog has different types of barks and growls. Um, this was his warning growl. This is the growl he does when there is danger coming and he's telling it to back away. So immediately I'm like, buddy, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? And then I hear a voice at the fence line. Mm. And it's not just any voice. It's the voice of a little girl. And it sounds like a creepy doll from a horror movie. It's got that kind of like mechanical quality to it. And it's kind of like muffled and garbled. <laughs> I'm still getting the heebie-jeebies. And all it does is go, hello? Just like that. Just, just like that. Hi, just same tone and everything. Now, mind you, it's midnight. There are not going to be any little girls wandering the woods at midnight. So immediately, I was like, well, this is either someone who's going to me um, or it's something else and what made me think it was something else was the fact that the voice said again hello only this time it had moved and it had gotten closer oh, and i'd no. heard no footsteps hell no nah. it was just it was just floating closer and then mind you my dog is still growling this entire time for the next five minutes that voice is just circling the fence line going hello hi hello hey like just just like that creepy doll you voice floating around the fence line um and then suddenly my dog stopped growling and he put his head down and he went back to sleep and the voice stopped um i thought okay cool <laughs> that was weird and then all of a sudden he lifted his head back up again and started growling and then the sound of a ticking clock came from the bush directly across from me. What was she thinking? Um, again, heard no footsteps, heard no rustling. Just a ticking clock started in the middle of the night, in the middle of the woods. So don't know what that was. Um, 
but if anyone wants to hop in the comments and let me know, uh, that'd be great. Cause I, I uh, can't wait to go home today and I don't see myself coming back here anytime soon. <laughs> And a big shout out to my protector. Yes, big, big scary boy. So she stayed in the woods the whole time? No, sir. This is the scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. No. And I wasn't even planning on making a video today, but I feel like I need to get out of my system because I have been welling up with tears and having full body chills from being scared. If you know me in real life, that never happens to me. So I feel like I just need to get out of my system. So this is that story. This happened four years ago. Um, I was a freshman in college and I was talking to this boy at the time and he caught me when I was coming home for the weekend from college and he asked if he could take me stargazing. I say yes, he picks me up. It's maybe 11, 12 o'clock at night. He drives me to the state park specifically because I had never been before. And, um, Specific to note about this state park next to my hometown, um, it isn't, when I say in the middle of nowhere, I legitimately mean in the middle of nowhere. The closest gas station is like multiple miles away. Nobody lives near there. Hell no. Um, yeah, you get the gist. So we get there. He originally parks in front of his watchtower. We're walking up the watchtower. Something to note about me. You're going to know about two of my fears today. I am afraid of heights the tower starts shaking from the small amount of wind. And I immediately am like, hey, I don't like this. We're about halfway up. I don't like this, let's go down. So he's like, okay, I actually thought you might be scared. So I have an alternate way for us to go look at the stars, but we have to walk through the woods. Usually, and before I get any comments about that, I know, okay, I know. The only reason why I went is because he was like, it's like a minute and a half through the woods. Perfect, a minute and a half, no worries. I shouldn't have listened to him because it was a 10 minute walk, if not more. It is so dark in those effing woods that you cannot even see your hand in front of your face. Hell no. Nah. Walking through the woods, I'm doing fine. Um, my other fear is the dark. Okay, I'm a full grown woman. I am exponentially scared of the dark. Like unrealistically scared of the dark we're walking we hit a fence and not just any fence a barbed wire fence by this time my eyes are fully adjusted in the dark and out in the distance i can see a barn and right next to the barn i see a big silo and if you don't know what a silo is it's just this big metal structure that holds corn where i'm from um a lot of farmers have them and i immediately ask him is this someone's land hmm. He doesn't really answer me, and I'm like, no, seriously, is this someone's land? Because I'm not going to get shot tonight. Because where I'm from, they're not going to ask you on their five acres of land what you're doing on their land. They're just going to shoot you because they don't know who you are at midnight, mm -hmm. one o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Or I guess what you are. So finally, he tells me it's someone's land, and I'm like, I'm not trespassing on someone's land. Like, no thanks. I Three strikes and you're out. I've walked through the woods. I have tried to conquer my fear of heights, and I'm walking in the dark. No. This is no. So finally he's like, okay, fine. Like we'll go back to the car and I'll drive you home. As we're walking, I don't know what it was. The hair on the back of my neck suddenly stood up. I start to feel like someone is watching me. Mm -hmm. And all my girlies with anxiety like me, you know what I'm talking about. But this was different. This was different. This was like burning two holes in the back of my head because they're staring so hard. Mm -hmm. And it was so bad that I kept turning around and there was literally no one there. My eyes are fully adjusted at this point. There is no one there that I can see. And I start walking so close to this dude that I'm flat tiring his shoes, which means I'm like stepping on the back of his shoes every couple of steps and he's mm. getting super mad at me. But eventually I just grab his arm and I say, there is something out here with us. And I made sure to whisper it because at the end of the day, if there is a living human being out there, I don't want them knowing that I feel like something is wrong. Mm. And number two, um, it was really quiet out there, like deafeningly silent. And he immediately tells me like, Elena, it's okay. Like your anxiety, it's okay. I understand that you're scared of the dark, but everything's gonna be fine. Like there's no one else out here. There's no other cars. Everything's gonna be fine. We take probably three steps 
and start to hear rustling. Ooh. And immediately, this is when my breath literally is taken away. Like, I'm like, <gasps> I can't breathe. And again, he's like rubbing my back and he's like, it's okay. Like, there is seriously no one else out here. What? You're going to be fine. We're walking for maybe a minute. Maybe a minute. We have our flashlights out. From our right, a rock doesn't tumble out. It is thrown out into the middle of the path that we're walking. Mm. I mean, like, right in front of us. Like, someone threw it. This was a game time decision, right? Right. I left him in the woods. Facts. I ran so fast, <laughs> I left him in the woods. I have never ran faster in my entire life. And all my running girlies, I ran for a minute. Sprinted for a minute. I get to his car and I'm trying the door handles and I immediately am going through all these scenarios. I'm like, what am I going to do if this per like if there is a person in the woods? So I'm trying the door handles. I'm going to like literally every door and all of them are locked. And all of a sudden I hear him giggling and like jogging out of the forest. And he was like, Man. the rabbit really scared me. A rabbit? And I probably look disgusting at this point, but I lit, I legitimately lost my mind on him. I was like, since when do rabbits pick up rocks and throw them at people? Since when, since when has that ever happened? But anyways, we get in the car, we drive off. The whole time I'm asking him, what do you think that was? What do you think that was? Do you think that was a real person? Do you think that was a ghost? What was that? And I don't think he took me very seriously at the time because he was like, whatever. Needless to say, I never talked to him ever again. And now I will elaborate on why it's so scary to me. I don't think that was paranormal by any means. Because when you experience something paranormal, it's almost like an instantaneous thought, right? You're trying to rationalize. You're trying to go through the scenarios in your head on how it is possible that that happened. This was different. I have never felt so fearful in my entire life. And let me ask you this. What? When you get home late at night, maybe after a night out or when you get home from work, school, etc. What do you think you're going to see when you turn the light on in your room? Probably some decor, probably your bed, your desk, maybe. Maybe a pet lives there. I don't know. But you anticipate on what you're going to see because you're prepared for what you're going to see. I'm not comparing bedrooms in the woods, but I was not anticipating someone else to be out there because there's no cars out there there was no way for someone to get out there if they didn't get there before the sun went down if you catch my drift and i think there's something at the end of the day there is something so deeply frightening about knowing someone was watching you the whole time mm -hmm. and there is something equally as frightening knowing you never saw them. And then you have to think about a plethora of things. Like, why was that person following two teenagers in the woods without making their presence known? Mm. How did that person get out into the middle of the woods in the middle of the night? I left a key part of the effing story out. When we got there and we got our little pass, the state trooper or whoever was working there told us that we were the last people going in. So be that as you may, Moral of the story, you never know. Too many red flags in that story. Look at this, dude. The person you just saw in that video was convicted sex offender and pedophile Edward Mascare. Edward was somewhat of a celebrity on YouTube because of the extremely bizarre videos that he posted all the time. These videos included a lot of dancing, lip syncing, and extremely disturbing and eerie expressions like this one above. Edward was born in the year 1932 in New York City. And from a young age, Edward wanted to entertain people, and that's what led him to Kansas City, Missouri. It was in Kansas City, Missouri, where in the 70s, he worked as the host of a children's program. This program, which Edward hosted until the year 1983, was called 41 Treehouse Lane. And like I said, this program put him around children all the time. Edward also hosted a late night sort of variety show that aired on local stations, and he was known as this zany, bizarre guy with a lot of energy. 
Well, eventually Edward started posting videos on YouTube as he got older, and people started seeing these videos, thinking they were really bizarre and funny, sharing them, and he became famous. But that's when people started to do Google searches of Edward and they found some disturbing history. Mm. You see, at one point in the past, Edward had been arrested for f children. And when people started to do searches of his name, they found all these records and began to expose him. Eventually, Edward couldn't hide from these accusations. He was forced to move cities multiple times. But when the authorities in Florida found out that he was posting videos, they went and arrested him because typically sex offenders aren't allowed to be on the internet, especially mm. not posting videos, which kids can easily access. So Edward was then rearrested in the year 2010, sentenced to five years in prison, and he died in prison in the year 2012. His YouTube channel is still up, and if you want to see some creepy pieces of media today, you can go check it out yourself. Hell no, I'm not checking that out at all. On the morning of November 29th, Christine Young suddenly woke up out of a deep sleep feeling a cold sensation come over her. It was exactly 5.45 a.m. and she noticed that her arms and legs were starting to go numb. She thought it was strange but brushed it off in the moment not knowing what it could have meant. After all, she needed to get some sleep so she could wake up to meet with her daughter later in the morning like they had planned for a while now. But when Christine's daughter Ashley didn't show up for their arranged meeting, she began to worry. She started frantically calling Ashley phone but got no response. So she called each one of Ashley's friends to see if they had any idea where she was. This is when she learned that her daughter Ashley had plans to meet up with 30 year old Jared Chance and hadn't been seen since leaving a local bar with him. A few days later police receive a disturbing phone call from a concerned neighbor in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This neighbor explains that he's just stumbled upon a tarp with a stream of blood leaking from it. When mm. police arrive, they find that the tarp is wrapped around a human torso. The owner of that apartment? Jared Chance. Mm. The DNA of the torso is tested and it comes back that it is human and that it does belong to Ashley Young. Mm. Ashley's arms and legs were later found in a box mm. in Jared's apartment. That's when Ashley's mom, Christine, recalls the incident from a few days prior. She believes that at the time she woke up at exactly 5.45 in the morning was the time of her daughter Ashley's death. Dang. Unfortunately, Ashley's head has still never been located. What? Come on, man. The man behind me is the real-life human Dracula. His name is Sutomo Miyazaki. He was born with a deformity that fused his wrist with his hands, so he was bullied a ton growing up. Then one day, later on in adulthood in 1988, something snapped in him. He started abducting little children, specifically little girls, and engaging in necrophilia. He would strangle his victims to death and then engage with their corpse. Whoa. He would even go as far as removing some of their body parts like their hands and feet and even their teeth. One way that made him also very similar to Jeffrey Dahmer, he would pose these bodies in different ways and photograph them. On one of his last instances before he got caught, he drank the blood of a little girl. And then right after that, he ate her hand. One day he was at the playground trying to take pictures of more little kids and the father intervened and stopped him. So Mr. Dracula behind me fled on foot naked and was caught by the cops later on. What? That's when they discovered his disturbing collection of photos and body parts inside of his apartment. However, he blamed it on his alter ego named the Rat Man. They were not playing any games with this guy. They immediately sentenced him to death. The government hung him on June 17th of 2008. Let me know what you guys think about the Rat Man or Dracula in the comment section below. And as always, these videos are for informational purposes only. This stuff is crazy. I, I don't know if you guys know the ability also when uh, people dream about stuff and like it also comes true. My yeah, mom man. has that stuff, bro. Like every time uh, she, she has a lot of bad dreams and uh, she always tells us like if it's spe specifically about us, she tells us because she doesn't tell us something bad happens to us. Because I remember this one time, I think she either dreamt that I got like stabbed or something mm. and she didn't tell me. And then like the next day I ended up like breaking my arm. But like it's always like that like she always has to tell people like if she dreams about you because if not then something's gonna happen to you you know what's crazy you saying about dreams i remember my mom said she had a dream she was in a classroom and she got out of the classroom she was walking down the hallway and she seen like a body like on the ground and she see another body on the ground like seeing dead bodies like all around and she heard like gunshots and she was counting them she heard 12 gunshots and then she stepped outside of the classroom she saw like people running all around and she got really scared and then she woke up and then the next morning she wakes up and we turn on the tv we're going through our day i guess there was a shooting at a college a guy went into the into the hallway started shooting people in the hallways and he killed 12 people mm. and my mom had a dream about that 
Mm. I believe that stuff be real, man. Some people got a gift. The like worst that. torture methods in history. In ancient times, there used to be a torture method where the feet of a prisoner were soaked in water. Then a goat was brought to lick the feet. Now, at first, it caused tickling, but soon, due to the rough texture of the goat's tongue, this turned into unbearable pain as the goat mm. licked all of the skin off. It only took one or two hours to get prisoners to reveal information. In ancient times, when people would unnecessarily fight with their neighbors, the person would be tied to a chair and dropped into water, close to the point of drowning. And this was repeated until the person finally promised to change their ways. Mm. Finally, there was the heretic's fork. This was a horrifying device with two sharp ends, which was fastened around the neck of an accused person. The sharp ends dug into their neck, causing severe pain if the person tried to lower their head. Over two to three hours, the device would slowly pierce further into their neck. Ooh. This video published anonymously on the dark web shows a man visiting an island that was supposed to have been abandoned years ago. But something was very strange. He then offered her meat, but it seemed to be human meat. Just eat. I know, but what kind of meat is it? Why don't you tell me what kind it is? I can't tell. You. Why? Eat the meat. Well, go get your own meat. See, it's good. Yeah, it's pretty good. You ain't never had meat like that, boy. You hunted this, right? Yeah, everything floats up. Stuff tends to just fall in my lap. I floated up on this island off a raft there. They're all over this place. Yeah. Mm. Someone call you dinner. Someone call me dinner? Ah, yeah. Why? You know why? I'm dinner? What does that mean? Nothing. How does it taste? It kind of tastes like pig. Not like a boar, like a wild boar. Mm. Interesting. That's a funny take. They have lots of like boar on this island or what? How big is this island? Do you know? There ain't no damn boars out here. Ain't no deers, ain't no boars. There ain't why nothing out here. Like? Really? Yeah. So like how did you get the meat? Oh, you must have went to the store then. There's a store on here? No. Fake shit, bro. Dude got a dirt bike. Let me back up. <laughs> Whoa. What you doing? What you see? Dear Papa. What? Papa. What you see? Hi. Uh uh. Who are you saying hi to? Who are you saying hi to? Dude, you need to stop that. You're freaking me out. Come on. SpongeBob night. The chair rocket? Liam, come here. Liam, right now. What is that? Whoa. Okay, I'm calling your mom. Just stay Whoa. right here. Whoa. I wish I could be a pirate again. You do? Yeah. When were you a pirate? I was a long time ago when you went alive and then I shrunk into a little kid. And I never could get a, be a pirate again. I'm confused. Someone recently asked me what the strangest thing I've seen in a police file is, and I think I have an answer. It's this trash can. Let me explain. So this trash can was found in Joan Rish's house in 1961, immediately after she went missing. Her young daughter had gone to a neighbor's house and told the neighbor that mommy is missing and there's red paint all over the kitchen. And when the police got there, they saw that the red all over the kitchen was blood. But there were also a few really weird details like this trash can, so the police had no idea what had happened to Joan. So first and foremost is the fact that this trash can is just in the middle of the kitchen. Normally it was under the sink, but here it is just in the middle of the kitchen for no reason. And then the contents of the trash made no sense. So here is the phone receiver, which has been ripped from the wall. You can see in this photo here that the phone is still on the wall, but just the mouthpiece was ripped off and then moved across the kitchen and neatly placed on the trash. And on the phone was a fingerprint they could never identify. People hypothesized that maybe someone was there and when Joan went to call for help, they ripped the mouthpiece off. Then there was this beer. So Joan's husband was out of town when this happened, but when he came back, he said that no one in the house drank Miller High Lifes. He didn't drink it, Joan didn't drink it, the trash had been taken out since the last time people were over, but yet there's Miller High Life next to the trash. Joan disappeared that day and was never seen again. And these Damn. two little pieces right here are some of the only evidence that someone else may have been in the house. They don't know if she ran away on her own, if she was taken or what. But the whole story is really wild and I tell it all tonight on the episode. Also, merch goes live when the episode drops. Damn.
This is one of the most sickening and disturbing cases I ever covered, and it will make any true crime fan stomach turn. This is the case of Jennifer Dodderty. This case took place in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, which is a relatively small area. Jennifer was 30 years old and was extremely kind and sweet. She loved to dance and she trusted everyone she ever encountered. This is because she had some mental disabilities, and this disability even affected her keeping up with her peers in school. Mm. And she always got bullied and teased, but she always chose kindness over anything else. She then started going to this community center when she finally thought she met her friends. And these supposed friends were Angela, Peggy, Amber, Melvin, Ricky, and Robert. And you will soon find out why they weren't her friends. These six people all lived together and Angela was 17, who was pregnant with Ricky's baby who was 23 years old. Amber was 20, who was pregnant with Melvin Knight's baby. Peggy was 27 and Robert was 36. Now remember, Jennifer was 30 years old, but due to the mental disability she had, she had the mental capabilities of a 12 to 14 year old person. Mm. The six of them and Jennifer hung out for a while, but soon after, Angela became extremely jealous of Jennifer. This is because her boyfriend Ricky would always flirt with Jennifer when they all hung out. So Angela and Amber came up with this whole screwed up plan. On February 10th, 2010, Jennifer was invited to a sleepover with her friends. And before she left, she left a note for her mom that said, Have a great day at work, and I love you very much. Right when Jennifer stepped into the apartment house, she was subjected to 36 hours of extreme hell. The group went through her purse and stole money, gift cards, and her cell phone. They poured liquids into her bag, hit her head with filled soda bottles, mm. cut her hair, painted her face with nail polish, and dumped liquids and spices on her head. They then took turns violently hitting Jennifer with a metal towel rack and crutches. Dang. Jennifer was also stripped naked, gagged, and then raped by Melvin. They even forced her to drink cooking oil, nail polish, detergent, different medications and even urine and what? keep in mind this whole time jennifer completely trusted them because she thought that they were all her friends but they were literally dehumanizing her they then continued pouring all of these things and spices on her head and jennifer was crying that her eyes hurt and she couldn't see but they didn't listen and continued pouring and after they decided they tortured her enough they took her life they mm. then tied her up in Christmas lights and forced her to write a fake suicide note, essentially saying that everything that happened to her was self-inflicted. The first line reads, I have not been feeling happy for a while now, and I also feel everybody will be better off without me. Mm. Which is just sad because that wasn't the case. Jennifer was extremely loved. Once the note was written, they got a knife and stabbed Jennifer to death. And once they knew she was dead, they tied her up in Christmas lights again, stuffed her body inside a garbage can and dumped it in the parking lot of a middle school where her body would be discovered by a truck driver the next day on february 11th what? even though angela orchestrated the whole thing she avoided the death penalty because she was 17 and a minor but she ended up getting life without parole melvin got the death sentence mm. ricky was also given the death penalty and peggy amber and robert were given 30 to 72 years in prison this case is just so sickening and disturbing and it stuck with me after I read it and I feel extremely bad for Jennifer and her family. Mm -hmm. I wish nothing but the worst for those six people who did this to Jennifer. People are crazy, bro. As promised, let's discuss the most disturbing and vile true crime case that you've probably never heard. But what's up? I'm Frankie. I talk about all things horror, true crime, and paranormal. So if you're into that, definitely give a follow give me a little like, and maybe comment. I would really appreciate it since I'm just starting this account, but let's get into it. Before we start, I will give a trigger warning because this story is so insanely graphic, but I will be censoring myself quite a bit because there's a lot I cannot say here, um, but I'm going to try to power through and give you all the information that I possibly can. But if you're not into that, then definitely save yourself and maybe scroll the next video. So this here is Charlie Brandt. So, in September of 2004, he was living with his wife, Terry, in the Florida Keys, and everybody who knew them said that they were madly in love, and they were very normal. He had a normal job as an engineer, and they spent pretty much all their time together. They didn't have any kids, um, but like I said, they were in the Florida Keys, and if you're not familiar with that area, they have really, really bad storms, 
So in September of 2004, there was a really, really nasty hurricane heading their way. So they were evacuated and they decided to spend some time with Terry's niece, Michelle, in Tampa. So they had decided to leave on September 12th. That was the agreed upon date between everybody. That way they could go home, check on their house, make sure everything was okay. But for some reason, Charlie insisted that they stay one more night and leave on the 13th instead. So everybody found that a bit odd, but they went with it and they just stayed the extra night. So fast forward a few days and Michelle's mother, who is Terry's sister, can't get a hold of any of them. So she tries calling Michelle a bunch of times, nothing, then Terry, then Charlie, no responses. So like any normal mother would, she starts to panic and she ends up calling Michelle's friends and just asks, hey, can you stop? you know, by the house, if you go out and just check on it, see if anybody's there, see what's going on. So her friends agree. They pull up to the house. All the cars are in the driveway, but they see no action. So they try the door, they try the windows, can't get in. So they're walking around the house looking for any movement, any noises, anything, and just nothing until they make it to the garage. So it was one of those garages that has the tiny windows up top. And unfortunately, they look in and see that Charlie was in there. Clearly, he had unalived himself. Ooh. So that is a very traumatic experience for anybody. So immediately, they call the police. And when authorities arrive, they walked into a scene that was so horrific that it actually made some of the officers quit their jobs after this case. And Whoa. almost every person on the scene became physically ill after witnessing Whoa. what went on inside this house. So as they get in the door, they see immediately to the right, Terry was on a couch, clearly unalived. And then they make it through the rest of the house and they make it to Michelle's bedroom and she is on the bed, clearly unalived. And she was unalived in such a horrific and graphic manner that I cannot even begin to describe to you on this app. So feel free to look up the case and look up the details. But as far as I can say, if you can imagine a body being mutilated in the worst way possible, time set by about a hundred, and then maybe you're getting close. So after seeing this scene, the police begin investigating and starting to question people. And everybody that they're questioning is saying they have no idea how this could have happened. They were all so normal. And Charlie was the most normal guy we've ever met. We can't imagine how he could possibly do this to his family, especially his loved ones. It just doesn't mm. make any sense. That is until they interview his older sister, Angela, who goes on to tell them a story that would change the entire trajectory of this case until the case came to a close. So Angela tells them the story about when Charlie was about 13 years old. It was January of 1971. They were living in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and it was a normal snowy night. They had dinner and they were all getting ready for bed. And when Charlie's mother, who was eight months pregnant, was in the bathroom, Charlie, 13 years old, walked in and unalived her. What? So Charlie's father immediately heard and ran in and Charlie turned around and attempted to unalive him as well what and made his way down the hallway attempting to unalive his sister angela but when he fired his weapon at angela it malfunctioned and that gave angela the time to make a run for it go to the neighbors and call the authorities wow. but when the authorities arrive they know charlie did it but charlie was only 13 years old and in fort wayne indiana in 1971 they could not actually charge him with anything so mm. instead they sent him to a psychiatric facility for a year after about a year, Charlie's father did survive the attack and ended up being the one to bail him out of there. He mm. fought tooth and nail for his son to get out, and he did. And that's when mm. they all moved to Florida. So nobody ended up knowing about this besides Angela. And they actually had two wow. younger siblings who they ended up telling that their mother passed away in a car accident because they didn't want them to know and grow up being afraid of Charlie. Hell so no. the other siblings didn't even know the truth behind how their mother passed away. So aside from Angela, the only other person who knew was Angela's husband at the time, this guy named Jim, who was also Charlie's best friend. So 
When Charlie was getting ready to marry Terry, Jim told him, hey man, you have to tell her about your past. You have to tell her what you did. You can't enter a marriage on dishonesty like that. Charlie kind of brushed it off and he was like, yeah, I will, I will. And then next thing you know, Charlie and Terry actually eloped. No one was alerted. No one knew about it. They just came back and they were married and none of the family even attended the Mm. wedding. So now only Angela and Jim know because we can put two and two together and assume that Charlie did never tell his wife, Terry. So time goes on and then Terry makes a very disturbing phone call to Jim one night and says, hey, um, something's going on with Charlie and I think I'm going to call the sheriff on him. And Jim Mm. immediately talked her out of doing that, asked her what happened, and essentially they had something called a fish gutting room. Um, So they were super into fishing and that's when they would prepare the fish. And apparently one day Terry walked in and Charlie was in there covered in blood but the issue was there were no fish so terry was absolutely petrified of what her husband could have done whoa was going to call the sheriff but jim talked her out of it and said you can't do that if he finds out and this isn't true you're gonna get a divorce so she didn't and it's crazy to look back at this case and think that if jim would have just acted a little bit different this whole thing might not have happened Mm. but again we have to keep in mind that jim might have thought that charlie did tell her he didn't know so there was that and then we also find out that the police found some really disturbing things when they investigated their home they found that they had an anatomy poster on the bedroom door so it was one of those posters of a human and it was a woman and it was her muscular and skeletal system and that's what was on the back of their bedroom door so they could see it from their bed i don't know i just find that so creepy and bone chilling after knowing the story and what happened i just find that incredibly odd but maybe that's just me but that was weird but they also found a log that terry had kept about charlie and it would just say you know not a lot of details but it would just say oh You know, Charlie had a weird day and Charlie came home really late that night and they found that really strange and tried to see if there were any connections between these dates and any other crimes that happened Mm. in the area. And it Mm. turns out there were a lot of connections with the dates of when Terry would log something and when another crime occurred in that area. I should also mention the fact that when they interviewed Charlie's coworkers, they had a lot to say about Michelle specifically, and they said that Charlie spoke about her in a very odd manner, and he actually called her Victoria's Secret, which is just so not appropriate to call your own niece. So it's just one of those cases that looking back, if a few things had been different or if somebody had maybe said something to either authorities or to Terry or even Michelle, this whole thing might not have happened. But again, nobody knew at the time, and this is just how things played out, and it is so heartbreaking and so sad Mm. and just the craziest case I have ever heard. I wish I could have given you more details. Maybe I'll make a YouTube video or like a podcast or something and actually fully talk about the case, but that is the true crime story of Mr. Charlie Brandt. That is wild. This is why you should be careful who you let work on your children. This dentist, Harold Snyder, would pull out more teeth than needed. He's worked with countless kids, and he would put them in stray jackets without any numbing medicine. What? And watch them scream in agony. He would even choke kids and tell them not to tell their parents. He choked me? Moms have even tried fighting him. He's had more than 50 parents complaining. Harold was later laid off because of his mental health, but supposedly he did all this because Medicaid was paying him for each tooth he pulled out. Mm. Mm. Yo, man, this thing right here gonna mess y'all head up, bro. All since I heard this, my head been jacked up, man. So we gonna all share in the feeling, man. This guy, he is a recording. He finna tell y'all how this lady went from this to this. And these pictures was taken Whoa. at the same day, Whoa. less than 24 hours apart. So she was one of the first black women to uh, be a cop. And all through, you know, through the hood, man, we just, you know, everybody knew her growing up. And uh, 
you just, you know, we just never thought that, you know, she would decide to, you know, go that route. Real smart girl, I'm talking about real smart, real intelligent. Always gonna figure stuff out, whatever you, you know, came out of which she, she solved it, helped you with it. She knew how to work on cars. She knew how to, you know, do little stuff around the house. She knew how to cook clean, like just a real, just knew everything. But now all her women's in her family. They was all, you know, like uh, maids, you know, did work around the houses or, or rich white people and stuff like that. Like, but now she said she didn't want to go that route. She want to be a cop. She wanted to have some power. She wanted to stand for something. And I, you know, not that, you know, she, not that being a maid or something, it's just, you know, you mean you don't stand for nothing, but just in her mind, you know, you young, you want to make a change. You want to be, you know, so that's the way she felt. So she went out there and got that job, and it was good for her, you know, like, she even got some little respect around the office. Now, I heard she had to bust a couple of them, them good old boys' heads. But eventually, they learned to respect her. But now, one night, she was out in a car with a partner. Now, all of a sudden, they get a call. Now, her partner, he responded to it. You know, he driving, she in the passenger seat. So down there, get there, it's an old warehouse. An old warehouse abandoned. And supposedly, there's some screams or something like that coming up out the warehouse. Mm. So they get there and they stand around and, you know, they look around. And uh, her partner ain't really want to go in. But this lady here, she wasn't scared of nothing. I guess growing up in the ghetto just, you know, make it a little tougher than the, you know, than the average. <laughs> but uh, this is sad ending to this story. And this is what she looked like after they found her this night. Mm. What's the story? This shit be blowing me. If you're ever walking down the street or at a random place and out of nowhere run into a loved one that is now gesturing you to follow them just blindly, I would definitely question it. It may actually be a D word taking the form of your loved one in order to get you alone. Story time, this person wants to be anonymous, so let's call her Lila. When Lila was about 11 years old, she was living in Malaysia with her family. They lived in an apartment building on the 12th floor. One day, she's walking home from school when she happens to look across the street and sees a woman standing there that looks just like her mother. The woman smiles at her and starts gesturing for her to follow her. It's just Lila is getting ready to cross the street. Her brother stops her and goes, where are you going? We're supposed to be walking home. Home is this way. Lila then responds with, don't you see mom? She's standing over there telling us to follow her. Her brother then goes, what do you mean? There is no one over there. Lila decided to brush off the experience and go home and act as if nothing had happened. Until a couple weeks later, she's sleeping in her room when she gets woken up by someone tapping on her leg. When she opens her eyes, she looks up and sees this creepy old lady standing there wearing her mom's clothes. Mm. This creepy old lady then starts to tell Lila to follow her out into the balcony. Now, mind you, her family lived on the 12th floor. Lila, of course, screams and wakes up her whole family. They all run in there and this creepy old lady is nowhere to be found. They automatically assume that she must have had a nightmare and decided to brush it off once again. Until one night, Lila's mom wakes up to Lila sleepwalking towards mm. the balcony. When her mom like shook her awake, Lila told her that her mom had been the one that had been holding her hand, walking her towards the balcony. This is impossible due to the fact that her mom had been asleep the whole time. This really started to scare Lila's mom, so she decided to take Lila to the temple so they could pray over her. Mm. Just a few days later, Lila wakes up screaming at the top of her lungs. She keeps saying that she sees the creepy old lady right outside of her window, dressed in her mom's clothes, telling her to come outside. Now, once again, they lived on the 12th floor, so there was no humanly possible way that a human could be just floating on the 12th floor. At that point, Lila ended up going back to the temple where they did a full cleansing and came to the home and they spread holy water all over it, just really clearing out any type of negativity or just negative energy that could have been left by this creepy old lady. The temple then told her mom that this creepy old lady that she had continued to encounter over and over again was actually a D-word 
that took the form of a human in order to capture their victim. From that point mm. forward, Lila's mom had five golden rules to follow to prevent anything like that from ever happening again. Let me know if you guys are interested in hearing them. I mean, these are five things that I've never personally heard of, but they're very true to Lila's heart and her culture. They be trying to leave these cliffhangers. This is reason number one as to why you should always be very careful when inviting anyone into your home, even family. So for those of you guys who follow me on here, you already know that my father and I don't have the best relationship. Recently, I found out that he had a baby, so I reached out. We ended up reuniting. I met the baby and decided to invite them over to my house for dinner. Mm. Mind you, my home is extremely, extremely protected. So if anybody comes in with any type of negativity around them, they're not going to feel well. So he comes over. The minute he walks in, he starts to become ill. He said mm. he felt like he was going to faint, like he didn't know what was going on. They ended up cutting their visit short and practically rushed out of the door. I didn't think much of it and just decided to go on with my day. The next day, which was on Sunday, I woke up in the worst possible mood. I couldn't understand why I was in such a bad mood. I had absolutely no reason to feel so angry, but something was just really bothering me. I decided to take the kids to go watch the new Spider-Man to kind of get my mind off of it. Once I left the house, I realized that I no longer felt like that anger. Like, it was gone and I felt fine. But the minute we went back home, I started to feel angry again. Decided to ignore it. I don't know why I keep ignoring things. Decided to ignore it, went about my day. That Monday I wake up, when I go downstairs, I notice that the house is dark. Like, there's this darkness around the house. My house is extremely light. I have, my shades are always open. I don't like darkness. But again, busy with work, I kind of just get ready and go about my day. When I get home later on that day, the house has this weird, like, rotting smell. My kids can't smell it, but I can smell it, and it's mm. bothering me. So I go around cleaning the house. I'm, like, bleaching. I'm scrubbing. I'm mopping. I'm like, where's that smell coming from? I even, like, deep clean the trash can, like, in the inside, thinking maybe something spilled in there. I couldn't get the smell from, like, out of my nose. That night, I go to bed and I end up waking up at exactly 3 a.m. So I'm like, fun. This is fun. I'm like getting chills even thinking about it. My mouth is so freaking dry. I go downstairs to get something to drink. When I go downstairs, I notice that the basement door is open. I Whoa. never leave that door open. So I shut it, grabbed the water, and went back to my room. The minute I lay down, I'm paralyzed. Whoa. But this thing paralyzes me and it shows itself. I'm like fighting back again. I'm not afraid of any of this stuff because I've been dealing with this stuff my whole life. So I'm pretty much laughing at it, telling it that it has no power and needs to leave. I start to mm. pray, pray and pray and it's continuing to like hold me down. At one point I'm able to break free and I like overpower this thing. I have one of those Stanley cups, the dupe, not the real one. I'm not spending $40 on a cup. Next to my nightstand and I started to hit it in the head with it. Once I did Whoa. this, it went away. I say my prayers and go to sleep. I wake up at about 6 a.m. and decide to go downstairs to get my coffee. When I go downstairs into the kitchen, I hear what sounds like something like fumbling in the basement, like something's falling Ooh. over in the basement. Ooh. And then I look and realize that the basement door is open. That gave me chills. I ain't even gonna lie. I have lived in this building for 17 years and I've never noticed this before and it's weird. So this is the refuse room. One. Two. Three. Let me back up. Four, jump out. Ain't playing with these people. Five. Some might jump out. I don't trust none of this. Six. Seven. I don't trust it. Nine. Eight. Just because the doors are slightly wonky. That's fine. Eleven. In the garbage room. Where the hell is 1214? Ah! Okay, I just had to be safe. I didn't know someone was going to pop out. Workers laying a pipeline make a gruesome find. They unearth the remains of a 12 year old girl who vanished without a trace after taking part in a Christmas concert in 1984. What? The mystery now, 35 years later, how did Janelle Matthews die? Everybody wants answers. Why, who, 
They want justice done. After that concert by her school choir, Janelle was dropped off at her home outside Denver, Colorado. Her mom, father, and sister were all out that night, so the house was empty. When her father came home about an hour later, the TV was on, but Janelle was nowhere to be found. Mm. She was never seen again. This is Janelle's parents at a prayer vigil shortly after she vanished. At the time, cops in Greeley, Colorado, believed her disappearance was a possible kidnapping. This case has just really weighed on the, the hearts of the Greeley mm. Police Department, along with the family and the city of Greeley. The site where Janelle's remains were found is 20 miles from her old home, Janelle's sister, Jennifer. It's bittersweet. It's the closure that we were always hoping for, but now raises other questions as well. And how are your parents doing? How's your family doing? They were a little numb at first. And then um, sad as well. And now um, it's um, just time to think about other things that we need to deal with right now. Shelly Lobato was a childhood friend of Janelle's. I thought, oh my goodness, they actually finally found her. My heart sank and I felt really bad for her family. That's crazy. Damn. So one time someone did dive headfirst into boiling water at Yellowstone after a dog. In 1981, David Kerwan was at Yellowstone with a friend when his friend's dog got away and jumped into a 200 degree hot spring. People around were screaming at David to not go in after the dog, but he didn't even give it a second thought. He just dove straight in. Some people completely dissolve when they do this because the pools tend to be very acidic, which I talk about in this week's episode, but that didn't happen here. So David was able to swim out far enough to get the dog, but he realized it was way too hot. So he had to leave the dog and turned around to come back. His friend was able to pull him out, but at this point, David was completely blind from the boiling water getting into his eyes. A stranger had also run over to help and he tried to take David's shoe off of his foot, but David's skin had completely melted and started coming off with the shoe. Ooh. And on top of all of this tragedy, Moosey, the dog, unfortunately didn't make it out of the hot spring. She was completely lost. And David also succumbed to the burns the next day. You'd assume at this point, people know the dangers of the hot springs, but people go into them way more often than you'd think. If you have a dark curiosity about this kind of stuff, you might be interested in the episode I just did. I would never. Roscoe gotta go. This is Sanju Bhagat, and in 1999, his abdomen was so swollen, everyone thought he was pregnant or had some sort of tumor in there. He eventually had difficulty breathing, so they rushed him to the hospital. And do you know what happened? He had been carrying his parasitic twin for 36 mm. years. Even the doctors were surprised. They all thought it was a tumor as well. Now, this is another case of fetus in fetu. I've covered it in another video. Basically, you have twins and sometimes one twin will absorb the other, but when the absorption is incomplete, this happens. The reason they call this a parasitic twin, even though it's partially absorbed, it still takes blood and nutrients from the host. Mm. The fetus continued to develop and even developed teeth, hair, and even genitals. So if you really think about it, Sunju was kind of pregnant, but with his own self, since it is mm. his twin. It's like an inception moment right now. Honestly, I'm sure if you looked at this guy, you would think he just had a beer belly or something, like a crazy beer belly. But no, those are two people in there. And yes, they did get it out of him. I probably can't show it because of guidelines, but just imagine Kirby, but more uh, wrinkly. That's basically how it looked. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, these videos are for informational purposes only. This kid went missing for 8 years and the reason why is disturbing. This kid was found a week ago after being missing since 2015 and everyone thought he was ended. When he was found, he couldn't speak because of how traumatized he was. But just yesterday, investigators talked to Ruby at a hotel, giving him a comfy environment to tell them what happened. What investigators uncovered was shocking. To hear what she did to her son? That's the damn devil. According to Ruby, his mother locked him up for eight years. When Ruby initially went missing, it was only for two days. And after that, he came back to his mother. After coming back home, his mom messed with him psychologically, convincing him that because he went missing for two days, police were going to take him to jail if he was found. She did mm. this over and over while giving him medication to hinder his thinking. Ruby was convinced he was in big trouble because his mom would do all of this and punish him in unimaginable ways. She told Ruby to use a fake name so no one would end up finding him. His mother did this because she was raising money through a GoFundMe. And if Ruby wow. was found, donations would stop. Ruby's mom also s abused him and Ruby's still psychologically hurt. The detective that revealed this when talking to Ruby started crying when he heard what Ruby's mother did. Mm. These people, man, what?
Three students pulled a prank on their art teacher who had told them and posted signs outside of her class that she is severely allergic to bananas. Columbus City School Security told officers the teacher's three attackers smeared banana on her door on the knob and then started throwing them at her while she was inside of the class. The teacher went into anaphylactic shock in less than 15 minutes. Mm. At 1.59, a call came in advice that a teacher had been shot. When they entered the room, they found a, a six-year-old child that was being physically restrained by a school employee. A Tipton County student faces charges tonight after police say he attacked a teacher. It happened Friday afternoon at the Tipton County Alternative Learning Center. Tonight, the teacher is recovering from his injuries, and that student is out on bail. Tragedy is struck again in the family of fourth grade teacher Irma Garcia, who died protecting her students. Shortly mm. after our cameras captured video of her husband, Joe, placing flowers at the memorial site, he died of a heart attack yesterday. Wow. Chisholm is accused of killing Danvers High School math teacher Colleen Ritzer. The 24-year-old is seen in released surveillance videos. It's chilling footage of her walking out of the frame and Chisholm seemingly second-guessing himself in the proceeding to follow her into the bathroom. These are the last moments of her life. Miss mm. Charlotte Singham's died from complications related to a student assault. A beloved high school teacher, her body with severe trauma to the head was found hidden in a local park. And now two 16 year old students have been charged as adults. You do not come up to me, Dr. Shu, get my goddamn face. You go there. All right, sit down. you go sit down. Man, what's up with these kids, bro? This is a real sign in a city called Davo in the Philippines and there's a lot of history behind it. Now, as you can see in the sign, it says waving children, please wave back with a pair of children with their arms up. This sign serves as a warning to everyone passing by that there are ghosts of children in the area. Mm. It's believed there's a ton of supernatural activity all around the area, and if you don't wave back, these children will come and haunt you. Whoa. Upon researching this story, I haven't found anyone reporting that they haven't waved back to any of the children. I've only heard accounts of people waving back and then being okay afterwards. So with that information in my head, I can only assume the worst happens if you don't wave back. Mm. So obviously, if you're traveling in the Philippines and you see a child wave to you, wave back for your own safety. The last thing you want is a ghost child following you and haunting you for the rest of your life. Let me know what you guys think about this. I also covered a video on the Aswang, which is another Filipino urban legend. Very scary stuff. Definitely go check that out. And if you have any suggestions, let me know. All right, so that was creepy, scary TikToks, different types, uh, also different type of stories, true crimes, a lot of disturbing stuff in this uh, video. You made it this far, you a real one for real. Drop that in the comments, man. A lot of disturbing stuff in this video, man. But hey, if you into this stuff, I got a TikTok playlist that you can go through and watch it, but that was a lot. But until next time, man, self-love and positivity. Fire Squad, I got you when you know it.